Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to do Unit 1, Scientific Investigation. Um, this is Section 1 of Unit 1. Okay, so what are the steps to scientific investigation? Um, first of all, you have to make observations. So you're gathering information using your senses and basically recording some data using scientific tools, maybe, possibly. But a lot of times in, in everyday life, you're just making observations. Like, um, for example, why is my air conditioner not cooling? It, does, it feels hot in here. Let me go check the thermostat. Oh, my gosh. I've got it set for 72, but it says that it's 74 degrees in here. Why? What's wrong with it? So that's when you start checking things, and you might have to call the air conditioner company. And then a guy comes out, okay, and he starts doing tests. So basically, that's scientific investigation. Um, maybe you are trying to cook with your microwave, and the microwave doesn't seem to be cooking properly. Your food still feels cold after you've cooked it for long enough. So you start, you know, problem solving and try to figure out what's wrong with the microwave. Don't do too much with the microwave, though, because you could get hurt. <laughs> but you, you get my point. Um, so we make observations every day, gathering information, trying to figure out if something's not working right. Um, and try to figure out what's wrong with it. And then if we can't fix it, we call someone who can. Okay, so that's where you develop that question that you are trying to find an answer to. Why is my air conditioner not cooling the house properly? Why is my microwave not cooking my food the way it should be? So what we are doing in the laboratory is basically the same thing. We um, talk about a topic and then we develop a question, which is our problem that we are trying to find an answer to through, you know, doing the experiments. So before you um, do your experimentation, you formulate your hypothesis. And you have to make an educated guess or prediction uh, as to what you think um, the problem is. You know, what's going to happen? Um, why did it behave this way? Or why will it behave this way? Um, but when we say educated, we mean educated. Okay, that means that you really do need to do a little bit of research or know a little bit about your topic before you do your hypothesis. Okay. Okay, so continuing with the steps. Uh, experimentation, we call it a con uh, controlled set of steps that will test your hypothesis and possibly find an answer to your question. You don't always actually find the answer. Um, maybe not the one you wanted sometimes, maybe not one at all. Sometimes experiments don't work out right. But we still go through the steps. Um, we end up with our results. Uh, that's all the data that you would get. And there are actually two types of data. We'll talk a little bit more about these in a second, but you have quantitative and qualitative. You usually take that data and you analyze it. So you can do statistical tests, you can make tables, you can make graphs, you can do a whole bunch of different things to visualize that data to make it a little bit easier to um, figure out the answer to the question you were trying to answer. Okay, and then finally you come to your conclusion, and that is when you um, use all that data, look at all that, and analyze it, and you try to see if you can find the answer to your question, and whether your hypothesis was supported or not by the data. Now, if your hypothesis is not supported, it doesn't mean that your experiment was wrong, it just means your prediction, you didn't predict exactly correct, but that's okay. That's how we do it in science. All right, so back to the quantitative versus qualitative. Um, quantity means numbers, so if you think quantitative, that's when you are collecting the actual numbers. You're using things like rulers and balances, um, any kind of you know equipment that you can look at and measure, thermometers. <clears throat> so just remember, it's all having to do with numbers. Qualitative, on the other hand, is where you're getting more into your senses. So you're looking at things like color and what does it smell like, you know, texture, taste. And again, we don't taste a whole lot in the lab, but sometimes you do. I mean, if you worked in a food laboratory, um, you might do some, you might be the taste tester. So that is um, something that some do. But if you see my little sign there, do not ever taste anything in chemistry class. Okay. 
All right. All right, so looking at our variables, this is what catches some people. Um, a lot of people get these mixed up. Um, independent variable is the one that you have direct control over. You actually manipulate that. You change that physically at the beginning of the experiment. Okay, and then the dependent variable is actually the one that you're collecting data on. So this is the one you have to wait on after your experiment does whatever it's going to do and then you start collecting the data. That is your dependent var variable. Just remember the dependent variable depends on something. It depends on the independent variable. So again, if you kind of remember independent begins with I, <clears throat> I change it. Okay, so that's the one you're changing at the beginning. And then the dependent is the one that you are measuring. Okay, so when we set up a graph, if you remember, your uh, independent variable is going to go on that bottom axis, the horizontal axis, also called the x-axis. And then um, your dependent variable will go on the vertical axis, also called the y-axis. So sometimes when you get them mixed up, if you're already given a graph, somebody else has made the graph for you, if you can remember, independent goes on the bottom axis and dependent goes on the side axis there. And you can pick your variables out pretty easily. All right. Earlier we mentioned control group uh, or a controlled experiment, actually. So looking at your control group, uh, this is something you really need as a standard of comparison. So your sample control group does not receive the independent variable. Okay. So let's say we're doing an experiment to see. Um, the effects of salt on, you know, freezing of ice. Um, they will use the uh, ice on roadways when it snows and stuff. So let's just say we're playing around with that in the lab. We're trying to see um, what the effect of salt has on the ice. So we're setting up an experiment. We got a bunch of ice. We're going to be applying salt to some of them. Well, you're going to need that one group that doesn't have salt added to it. You're not going to add salt to it. So that's your control group does not receive the independent variable because you kind of need to see how quickly the ice is going to melt or what the ice is going to do without salt so that you can compare it to the, the ice cubes that you're adding salt to. If you don't have that one without um, the salt, then you're not going to have anything to compare the other ones to. You kind of need to see it under normal circumstances, okay, and in this case, without the salt. So, and like I said, practical application of that is, you know, roadways when it snows outside, you know, why are they applying the salt? What does it do? So, and you usually need uh, a control group to make the experiment valid, okay? So, you can argue, hey, this is what happens under normal conditions, but when we apply our variable to it, this is what happens. Okay, and when we look at our scientific research, um, you can uh, call some of them one is pure research. Um, that's just you looking up information, knowledge for knowledge, basic facts. Um, you know, you could just be looking it up because you're curious. But a lot of times, uh, especially in school, you're going to be looking it up so that you can learn information so that when we do experiments, you'll understand what's going on. Um, same thing in a, in a research laboratory, you know, they need to know things before they can even get started. Improves your understanding, you know, of the world, natural phenomena and all that. And it helps you to make educated predictions or to help you develop your hypothesis. Okay, so that's pure research. That's basically, you know, we might do some labs. I might have you do a little research before we get started so you understand. Or we might just do a little lecture and talk about some things before we get started. That would be pure research. Uh, applied research is um, used to actually solve specific problems, and this one, especially right now with COVID-19, it's motivated by need. Um, uses technology or other techniques um, to actually alter natural phenomenon. And our examples here, we had cancer research, but today I added creating a COVID vaccine because that's what everybody's doing now. They're trying to apply what they know and create something that we really need, okay? So that's actually them in the laboratory using that peer research 
Um, and unfortunately, COVID being so new, the peer research is changing constantly because they're constantly learning new stuff. All right, and the last one are chance discoveries. Um, that's when you're doing something in a lab or you're just doing something and all of a sudden, wow, this happens. I didn't expect this and I learned something new. There's been so many discoveries that have happened by accident. Um, you know, scientists studying one thing and then something else happens. And, you know, like with antibiotics, you know, that was an unexpected discovery, which was a great discovery. Um, so I have a little um, science article. If you're interested, you don't have to. I'm not going to uh, grade you on it or anything. But if you're interested in some chance discoveries, that's a nice little article that you could click on if you wanted to read it in your spare time. Okay, so that is scientific investigation and we will be doing um, a lab to put some of these into effect uh, in our next class.